Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. If you enjoy the material we create and the incredible speakers who very generously give their time to make it happen, please like, subscribe, share, and also comment because that really does help the videos uh, discover a new audience on YouTube. That's how the algorithm works. Please do also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that we have in the description of the video. Uh, they're doing incredible work, especially ones like Harp and Superhumans. Uh, and it's absolutely critical at this time that we continue support for Ukraine. Maria Zolkina is a Ukrainian researcher and public policy analyst who joined London School of Economics and Political Science as DINAM Research Fellow in 2022. She's also been working as Head of Regional Security and Conflict Studies at one of the most authoritative Ukrainian think tanks, the Iko uh, Kucherev, uh, hopefully I got that right, Democratic Initiatives Foundation, and is co-founder of the Kalmius Group. Maria is focused on research analysis in the fields of regional security, reintegration policies towards conflict afflicted areas and public policy regarding occupied territories and wartime diplomacy. Since 2014, she's been producing expertise on socio-political components of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And of course, these insights are absolutely critical at this time, especially regarding the Donbass region. Maria is a frequent contributor to the international media. Well, I've been looking very much forward to this and speaking with you. I've seen you at a number of events and was absolutely stunned by your expertise. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the channel. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I am glad also that it, it has finally happened because we have tried to make an agreement about the time and an opportunity to talk to each other for a long time already. Well, thank you so much. And of course, it's it's absolutely understandable. You are in huge demand and your expertise uh, that really cover the whole range of Russia's aggression from hybrid aggression, infiltration, insurrection in Donbass, Crimea to the present. Uh, it's quite clear why your expertise is in such demand at events and also, of course, uh, in, uh, you know, consulting and helping to inform uh, policymakers. Well, let's start off with the froth, with the news that's happening this week two extraordinary uh, news items which are unfortunately getting in one case too much oxygen the other way i think the emphasis is wrong one of course is tucker carlson's uh i would say fairly nauseating uh interview with uh with uh, the dictator in the aggressor nation next door um and then of course we have the news breaking of uh, General Valery Zaluzhny, who is uh, be moving on from his post as head of the armed forces. So this is this is quite a big uh, week that's refocused news, not necessarily in the right way. Do you have a take on these two stories, or what? What do you think? How do you think we should be interpreting these in a more measured way, rather than the kind of media frenzy that we're seeing? First of all, of course, I, I have to say that despite the fact that media attention uh, and focus on these, let's say, two developments and two events uh, is pretty much comparable in terms of how big the scope of media attention, both to, to recent, actually yesterday's uh, Putin interview and to what has happened to chief commander, now former chief commander um, of the armed forces in Ukraine. But Generally, there is a, a gap actually in significance uh, of these uh, uh, two events because what has happened in Ukraine um, uh, can have really significant uh, consequences, not only domestically, but, all, but also internationally because the war has impact not just on Ukraine, but on the entire situation in the region of Eastern Europe, in transatlantic community, and this is of extreme importance. Uh, who and how exactly is leading the military campaign on behalf of Ukraine. Uh, while uh, when it comes to Taika Carson interview with Putin, we haven't heard anything new at all, despite the uh, duplication and <clears throat> uh, um, multiple um, uh, multiple underlines on the side of Putin, the saying that Ukraine is has never existed, doesn't have right to exist, and doesn't have right for a statehood. Uh, and by the way, um, Putin has um, actually he has made a couple of differences in comparison to what he said previously. First of all, now he started the history of the Russian uh, state 
uh, even from pre-Kiev Rus times, I was basically laughing while listening to, to another historical uh, introduction uh, for, for, for 10 or 15 minutes uh, from Putin. But previously, he, 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 he was saying that Ukraine, uh, this is just historical land of current Russia, but now he is stating that Russian state was established before even the Ukrainian, proto-Ukrainian state was established, which is very well known fact, uh, started from the end of 9th century with Kiev Rus state when Moscow doesn't exist, didn't exist a, a, at all. So basically, and, and, and another uh, thing is that this is Ukraine who started the war in 2014. Uh, another emphasis, which uh, we heard previously from Putin, but it was not that much underlined. But basically, the main message of Putin was not for Russian domestic audience, was not even for political leaders of uh, democratic states, was not even for international audience in general. My impression is that it was a kind of political technology to talk precisely with people who are going to vote for Trump, because everything Putin was saying was resonating with main Trump messages about the fact that uh, previous or current American elites who are in charge, who are in power, they are, uh, they are uh, to blame for, for the outbreak of the war. Uh, and that every, everything um, should have been stopped and could have been stopped uh, like uh, in case Russian demands were uh, were fulfilled. Uh, so he is leaving the impression or he's trying to leave an impression with this audience that the end of the war, like Trump once said in 24 hours after he is inaugurated, is still possible in case all the demands on the side of Russia are fulfilled and accepted, which is completely not true because the end of the war is possible in 24 hours from any moment, in case Ukraine agrees to capitulate and sees its ex existence as a state. That's possible. That will be true. But I don't see any other additional value here because I see the idea of Putin and Tucker Carlson to talk precisely with people who are already Trump electorate or, uh, or can be potentially an electorate for Trump. So basically, he was talking to them, not uh, not to. He was not sending messages to international community, to political elites of Europe or Biden himself. Uh, but Valeria's illusion is a different story. Um, is a different story. Uh, the story has started several months ago um, to the level when it became pretty obvious. Um, and um, we, we started receiving first news about the tensions between President Zelensky on the one hand and not just Zaluzhny, but let's say uh, military command uh, um, led by General Zaluzhny at that time. But the main problem for me, so I was just as a spoiler, so I don't support this decision because I see institutional challenges for Ukraine arising, the political and institutional challenges arising for Ukraine from this president decision. I think this is a mistake because there was absolutely no um, claims about professional skills of uh, General Zeluzhny. This is very important that he was not and is not a politician. He is a professional young uh, military guy uh, who was um, talented and was focused on NATO standards. Uh, everyone in the army under his command was underlying his very human attitude towards uh, the military stuff in the army, which is completely opposite to, let's say, Soviet school of how military commanders behave towards the people under their command. So he was very, and he is very human. Uh, he never organized and never supported any ideas of using people as a cannon folder. Uh, and basically we haven't heard from President Zelensky or from his team clear messages why exactly General Zeluzhny was dismissed. 
if there were specifically uh, something which was dissatisfying the President Zelensky in terms of professional delivery of, uh, of the functions of uh, chief commander, then it should have been said. There was nothing like that said. Instead of this, we, uh, we, we had a communication and information um, uh, chaos, I would say, because there was no clear messages why it's happening. But there was an understanding that most probably there are political motivation behind this decision. And after the dismissal was actually formalized uh, and the new chief commander was appointed yesterday, um, I have more and more um, certainty that uh, there was more politics behind this dismissal rather than rationality. That, of course, is a concern because it suggests that there isn't a strategic change behind it. Um, but we'll come back to that because I think strategy is something we want to really sort of focus on through the core of the interview. But let's just briefly touch on the Putin-Tucker Carlson. So we learned nothing new except perhaps that Putin is completely disconnected from any current reality and historic reality. But it was also, if it wasn't already clear, this seems to be a blatant attempt to interfere in and influence the upcoming U.S. election. Um, we know that Russia doesn't work in one medium alone. So you've got this very visible interview going on as an attempt to influ interview, uh, influence the election. Do you think it's also going to be accompanied by a huge informational campaign to try and swing the vote? And I say this sort of knowing the answer partially because we're seeing a huge uptick on platforms like Twitter or X uh, of disinformation, propaganda, bots and, you know, the general filth. Anyone posting anything on Ukraine is going to be suppressed and, and very heavily targeted. Yeah, I see no chance that Russia will not interfere, at least on information and propaganda level, the elections in core countries. And here, all our attention is basically focused on U.S., but we have more than 70 elections this year in um, democratic states all around the world. And I think this is a, one of the biggest challenges for the entire world right now, because countries like Russia and China will be interested in uh, creating informational chaos, in widespread propaganda, uh, in creating the, uh, the spots of destabilization and instability all around the world. And U.S., of course, is the most needed for Russia target from this point of view. And unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, partially domestic public opinion in America, namely in the right wing sector of Republicans, appear to be favorable environment right now uh, for this Russia's uh, interference. Of course, it will not look like a direct interference and Russia will uh, create, try to create an impression that they have nothing to do with domestic processes in U.S., but we have seen already how they interfered U.S. elections previously, and a number of tools were already used, both uh, in terms of violating the cybersecurity, violating the informational hygiene uh, um, environment, and now Russia understands pretty clear if Trump does not win these elections, then situation is much more unpredictable for Russia uh, than in case he wins. So this is in their best interest to help him win by any means. It does not mean that Russia will double down only on something related to Russia, to Ukraine, to Russia's representation as, a, as an actor of international relations, it means that they will use every and each opportunity to polarize the American society, uh, to use um, various messages to, uh, to tackle every and each issue which can potentially create instability in, in, in the times of elections in US. So that's why um, basically all this populism and propaganda tools, they will be very actively used and Russia will do its best uh, to help, uh, to help uh, Trump win. 
Uh, and that's why I'm actually worried a bit, not just about how this affects and impacts um, the support of US uh, to Ukraine, but generally transatlantic community. Uh, we, we, we understand very well that European Union was not up to 2024 ready to be a political leader of international coalition in support of Ukraine in the times of Russian aggression. Every international actor in this uh, democratic coalition of states was benefiting from the fact that the US is a political leader of this coalition by default, not just because they are the main financial, the main military donor to Ukraine, but because they have enough courage and braveness and political weight internationally to be the leader de facto of the coalition. When the US is stepping away from this role, maybe temporarily, maybe for a longer period of time, because of domestic turbulence and domestic struggle between Democrats and Republicans, Trump and Biden in particular, you, who is going to be in charge of this leadership for 2024? For 2025, I, this is even a longer perspective now, but 2024, there is a gap already. And European Union is scared um, and is uh, actually shocked by the possibility of Trump re-election, probably even more than Ukraine. Yeah. Because, because, because Ukraine uh, uh, simply cannot actually impact and cannot influence what's going in the US. It can only try to protect its interests and try to... Um, get out of this trap like now with financial aid when ukraine is is was trapped by by the by by the populistic and political technology manipulations uh, because of the border and everything so this is not a, because republicans are generally against uh, the aid to ukraine this is basically because ukraine ukrainian issue was taken as a hostage political hostage of domestic struggle about something else uh, on the eve of the elections. But European Union, European states are even more scared because no one uh, did have this uh, as a priority to be a leader of a democratic world. When China is preparing to invade Taiwan in several years and all the security analysts openly or not openly are talking about this and uh, drawing this as one of the really possible scenarios for 2027. Uh, when Russia is still capable of winning in Ukraine, which I think we have forgotten because of some very significant um, successes of Ukraine, first in 2022 when the state has survived and repelled Russia's attack, second when Ukraine had a couple of uh, very significant counteroffensive at the end of 2022, uh, and even after 2023, uh, much more moderate results than were expected of counter-effective um, attempts uh, in summer and in autumn 2023, we, we have forgotten somehow that the opposite scenario is still possible. That in case Ukraine does not receive support, in case Ukraine is deprived of weapons and financial aid, then it's weaker than Russia much more, and the gap between capacities and capabilities of Ukraine and those which Russia possess will be huge, and Russia will definitely use this, especially in 2024. And it's already happening to an extent in that uh, the number of shells, the ratio between shells that are able to be fired by Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Ukraine started to pull ahead last year, I believe, at the end of the, um, uh, you know, the the the, the counteroffensive, uh, and Ukraine was actually able to 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 fire off more. Um, we don't know the exact ratios, but certainly that balance. And now, of course, uh, North Korea is uh, apparently supplying um, huge amounts of munitions, and that. Uh, has swung the other way. Um, so that poses a significant risk. Now, of course, these artillery systems are still not particularly accurate. Uh, there are talk about the quality of Ukrainian shells, but in terms of, uh, not Ukraine, um, North Korean, but in terms of volumes, certainly it's exceedingly worrying. Let's tie then these events together, the dismissal of Zaluzhny and potentially the need for a 
different strategy and a different approach. We've seen the emergence of a new and for those who are extremely pro-Ukrainian and, and believe in a full-scale victory, um, quite a heartening change of strategy, and that is striking Russian oil energy infrastructure, um, military and some of it sort of potentially also supplying the domestic market. But these extraordinary strikes on the LNG terminal and others, um, this is this is this is a concerning period because that strategy seems to be putting huge pressure on Russia and seems to be a very effective way for Ukraine to to start to perhaps see how a victory might be attained. Do we know whether the change in the leadership is connected to these strategies and will the new military leadership in Ukraine be supportive of and potentially escalate what seems to me a very powerful strategy or Will they perhaps do what the U.S. is perhaps pressuring more? And that is con focus on the conventional battlefield, which is going to be far, far more problematic, I think, for Ukraine to to achieve a full victory through conventional warfare alone. Classical conventional approaches to win over Russia will not work in case of Ukraine. This is absolutely not a military secret. I am not a military expert in particular, but this is not something which is uh, hiding from the wide public. In his recent article uh, for CNN before, for CNN website before, he was dismissed. General Zaluzhny has described explicitly and exhaustively uh, how he see the possibilities for Ukraine. Uh, to win. And basically, this is not just an, uh, one of the options. I would say that this is the only option, because the potentials in various sectors when it comes to weapons or number of ammunition or even number of um, human resources in the army, potential is different. In this case, it does not mean that the smaller state cannot win. No. This means that the smaller state has to fight differently. And the only way Ukraine can win and uh, the, th the, the direction, the track Ukraine should double down right now is to make the warfare on the side of Ukraine as highly technological as possible, as digitalized as possible. Just uh, one example. So there are a lot of talks about Crimea. A lot of talks, both military talks and, and political. Political talks are basically uh, circulating around the idea that um, uh, Crimea is something specific for Russia and this is another red line for Russia and Russia will use nuclear weapons or uh, will start a war against NATO in case Ukraine tries to recapture but basically return the control over Crimea after 2014 um, annexation. But military discussion around Crimea looks completely different. So military personnel, both in Ukraine and their counterparts in European states, say that the key to victory over Russia is Crimea, actually, because this is the main Russian military base. Until recently, it was the main Russia's um, naval base for Black Sea Fleet. And how Ukraine made Russia withdraw its Black Sea Fleet from Crimean seaports is the best example how technologies, creative and asymmetric approach to planning of the military campaigns is winning over conventional warfare used by Russia. What Ukraine does not have a fleet. We don't have a fleet at all. But Ukraine used the sea drones created absolutely um, unacceptable situation, sank down the flagships of Russian Black Sea Fleet and made Russia withdraw the rest of its uh, warships from Crimea to Novorossiysk, where it is much less possible for Ukrainian drones to reach. So this is the best example. If you cannot just fight one warship against another one and organize a battle like in the times of the First or Second World War, you use other approaches and you defeat your enemy by other means than your enemy is uses. And that is why, so 
in military staff and military experts are underlined that unless Ukraine controls Crimea, it is not possible to speak about the victory, uh, at least at this, at this stage of the war. How to return Crimea? Everyone again imagines that there should be a conventional land operation of the ground forces of Ukraine trying to enter the Crimean Peninsula through a very narrow, um, uh, narrow uh, corridor connecting the peninsula with the, with the continent. Uh, then everyone describing mountains and completely unfavorable landscape for Ukrainian grand forces along, uh, to, to conduct an operation there and bloody battles there. But from a military point of view, Ukraine does not need all this to make Russia withdraw from Crimea. The only thing Ukraine needs is a enough, sufficient number of longer range missiles to be able to destroy the Crimean bridge, which is serving to supply all the weapons from continental Russia to Crimean Peninsula. Then to precisely in a, in a, in a, uh, to precisely um, strike all the military enterprises and military bases and stockpiles of Russian Federation in Crimea. With, with the missiles like Storm Shadows uh, or Atacams, which or Taurus from Germany, Ukraine will not create harm from, for civilian population. So you, this, this is why Ukraine is insisting so much and receiving that precise type of, uh, of the missiles, because they will allow Ukraine to deprive Russian military forces who are based in Crimea from their capacities to survive and to fight. And at some point, deprived of all these stockpiles and means, Russia will be in completely unfavorable position and will have to withdraw their forces from Crimea somehow in the framework of negotiations, in the framework of just uh, using their ships uh, or any other way. And I don't actually uh, believe that um, uh, this is something impossible for, for our Western partners to provide Ukraine with. I, I see that, the, so, sorry for, be, for speaking too long about this, but the Crimean story and the perspective of this precise operation, in my opinion, is, is the best example how you can win depending on what you have. What you have. And the only, the only reason Ukraine still does not have all those means precisely uh, enough number, sufficient number of longer range missile is a political reason. Because everyone understands that in case Ukraine has this, they will use this and defeat Russia in Crimea. And what to do with Russia after that? A number of our partners, including current U.S. administration, simply do not know. They are not ready to settle any future with Russia. They don't have a strategy towards Russia in case Russia is defeated. And that's why it impacts how they were providing Ukraine with weapons. Uh, what they actually gave Ukraine, when, in which quantities, and whether they are ready to, to supply anything else at all. You've anticipated my, my next question, my next two questions, in fact, um, because it seems to me that there are several problems here, and I've, you, you've really touched on two of them. One is, it's not a physical limit of capabilities. You know, if we had the will to provide those munitions, they would have been provided before now and as you say they would have been sufficient to achieve those objectives so it's a matter of will not not capability so it suggests that the west doesn't have the will to to do that or even more worryingly has concerns about a full ukrainian victory and has i would say unreasonable concerns about whatever happens to russia after that uh, something that is limiting their actions is it also possible that Russian propaganda is still working uh, behind the scenes here? And, you know, I, I was in an event in, in Paris in December. I spoke to a number of people extremely pro-Ukrainian, but within the European political sphere. 
And I was stunned and shocked to hear that they still seem to be influenced by the idea that Crimea is part of Russia, that Crimeans want to be Russian, um, completely ignoring the idea that there has been a population replacement. There has been ethnic cleansing and somehow they are concerned, more concerned about the rights of the colonists than those they have displaced or who they are suppressing. And to an extent, that mindset still seems to hold around uh, Donbass, even though we know that the male population of Donbass is being genocided in meat wave attacks and civilians are being repressed, tortured, etc. We cannot know what proportion uh, of people there, um, you know, have any sympathy with with the so-called Um, But we do know from personal testimony, people have many family members who are repressed in those territories. This does not seem to enter into the strategic calculus of the West. And it does seem that Russian propaganda is still effective at controlling Western thinking. Uh, we must uh, acknowledge, unfortunately, that uh, in 2014 and after 2014, Russia has succeeded in pushing forward its narratives, not Ukrainian, not connected to the international law, but Russian narratives about what happened to Crimea and what was going in Ukrainian Donbass. I'm originally also from, from Ukrainian Donbass, so I was um, raised there and my family continued to live there on the front line, in the front line village in Luhansk region, 10 kilometers from Russian border until the night of 24th of February 2022. So this is something very, very close. So I, I feel with my skin everything which was there uh, uh, until the very end of all this hybrid stage of the war. But Russia succeeded in pushing forward the narrative that Crimea is a Russian territory, was Russian territory for ages, and, and this is completely different from entire Ukraine. Unfortunately, the international community and unfortunately Ukrainian leadership at that time itself were not ready to give a radical response to Russia to the annexation of Crimea. So this was so rapidly organized and the Ukrainian government, after the President Yanukovych has fled the country uh, and his helicopter is just uh, with all his gold and everything, shooted by, by cameras and CCTVs all around uh, his, uh, uh, the, the place around his residence, it was so rapidly and the new government was so unstable in Ukraine, no one really believed that this was happening that this was serious, that Russia would really declare annexation of Crimea in less than a month after Russian green people, how they called them, uh, just appeared in, in Crimea and started blocking all the administrative buildings and military military um, military bases of, Ukraine, of Ukrainian uh, armed forces in Crimea. And the international response was actually almost absent. And that opened the win not just the window, it opened all the doors of opportunities to Russia to do whatever they wanted during next eight years. No one talked about Crimea's return to Ukraine. Uh, when President Zelensky um, was elected, um, I completely disagreed at that time uh, with his idea to look into the eyes of the Putin in 2019, his famous phrase, which was not supported uh, by many in Ukraine, uh, that he believed he would be able to, to make a deal, to, to have a constructive conversation with Putin. This attempt completely failed. And uh, the first and the only one Normandy summit uh, with moderation of France and Germany at the, in December 2019, was a failure. So Putin came, agreed to nothing which was a, at least slightly against the interest of Russia. And this was a useless attempt, let's say, to, to find the a ground for constructive conversation with Putin. But the only uh, thing which uh, was of strong support on the side of many Ukrainians and experts uh, in President Zelensky at that time attempts uh, to 
to somehow to add a dynamic to the conflict resolution was the creation of Crimean platform. So he raised the issue internationally about the restoration of Ukraine's control over Crimea, because after 2014, Russia used very wise approach. They have annexed Crimea and organized the hybrid invasion into Donbas with regular Russian forces. This, so everyone forgot about Crimea and looked into the more dynamic situation in Donbas, where the negotiations were taking place for eight years. And Russia succeeded in pushing the narrative that there are separatists in Donbas and there was no regular forces of Russia and Russia just a moderator, despite the fact that Minsk trilateral contact group was composed of Ukraine, Russia as the members of the group, special monitoring mission of OEC in between as a moderator. And there were representatives of uh, non-government controlled areas, both in Donetsk and in Luhansk, but they had no status. The negotiations were held between Ukraine and Russia. And those people who came from Donetsk and Luhansk were part of Russian delegation to Minsk trilateral contact group. So they were not separatists, they were no independent actors. And in Nor and Normandy format itself, the main format of negotiations, again, Ukraine talked to Russia with mediation of Germany and France. There were no separatists there. And, uh, and but, but the international community never went into details. I mean, why the public? And unfortunately, even in 2022, when it was completely obvious that Russia was occupying Donbas, was occupying Crimea, and now started occupying part of Kherson and Zaporizhia region, I still found the formulations, even on BBC website, and talked to BBC people after that, that they were writing like, uh, occupation, Russian occupational administrations in, Zapor in, Zapor in part of Zaporizhia and Kherson region, and self-proclaimed or separatist republics in Ukraine and Donbas. So even at that time, after large-scale invasion, it was not thrown away from the public discourse entirely that all these territories are equal in terms they are occupied by Russia. And this is an obstacle right now to Ukraine, uh, especially, but I think that the main challenge will be Crimea in terms of discourse, uh, because Russia is still um, pushing forward the idea that Crimea is a special case. And this is a red line for Putin, especially in terms of possible usage of uh, nuclear weapons, which I don't believe they will do, but that's just a speculation. We don't know. Uh, but Donbass is, uh, is, is not an issue to talk at all. Even geographically, this is not possible. If Ukrainian armed forces are moving forward and recapturing back the territory which was occupied by Russia in starting from 2022, this is even geographically not possible to stop somewhere uh, um, in, a, in an open terrain because it was a front line in 2014. So no one will do that. They will continue unless they, uh, they can. That's clear. Mm -hmm. And moreover, like a person from the region and person who was as an expert working on um, the conflict around Donbass starting from 2014, um, I have my, my sources, my network of people living still in occupied territories, and all of them are saying that after 2022, the, the th they, they had a feeling that uh, the destiny of the Donbass uh, could be solved more easily than it was expected between 2014 and 2022. Because in case Ukraine succeeds any elsewhere, they it could succeed here as well. Because before 2022, even Ukrainian society who was not ready to compromises in terms of territorial concessions to Russia, but Ukrainian society, I can assure you, would not support a military uh, a military campaign to regain control over Donbas. War, idea of the war 
was not supported in Ukraine, even in order to restore Ukraine's control over Crimea and Donbas. Ukrainians in their absolute majority, according to all the public opinion polls starting from 2014 until 2022, February 2022, were in favor of diplomatic solutions. And now, of course, that's changed the sheer brutality of Russia's invasion, uh, the appalling crimes that were uncovered in Butcher, Pin and other places. For those who've seen uh, 20 Days in Mariupol and spoken to anyone who managed to get out of that city, um, the thought of Russia's extraordinary, uh, I would say, Stalinist uh, era crimes that have been carried out now at least for Ukrainians, make the idea of negotiating or thinking of Russia as a potential negotiating partner um, completely inconceivable. How would you address that, though? Because part of this idea of a stalemate and negotiation and being able to negotiate in good faith is a key part of Russia's propagandistic efforts. And as you mentioned, it, it came up in the Carlson interview, uh, so-called interview as well. Um, this is a key part of Russia's strategy, isn't it? Is to still convince the world that it can be trusted as a negotiating partner. But could you put that in the context of uh, the Minsk agreements and the violations of those, what we've seen during the full-scale war, and indeed maybe even deeper historical Russian context, because you, you Ukraine... Um, you know, lost its protest statehood uh, because of uh, Muscovy essentially break, breaking agreements and reneging on agreements that were made. Um, so what's the position now on negotiation and why is it not viable? Um, exactly because we had an experience of 2014-2022. Uh, just uh, Putin also touched upon this issue and said that uh, Russia was not supporting the Minsk agreements entirely, but was ready to, uh, to <clears throat> so to say, implement them, which is the practice proved to be completely untrue. Minsk, the Minsk agreements is basically not an agreement at all. These are accords. Uh, they have never had any official status of uh, an agreement, uh, neither in Ukraine nor in Russia. It was a political deal, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> But the fact that there were basically like this is to put it in the, into the context, just to remind ourselves, there were two means documents, basically. The first was signed in September 2014, and it was signed, Ukraine signed this exactly and exclusively because Russian regular forces without insignia, this which was proved later by the documents of International Criminal Court, by the way, in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, when they uh, confirmed that uh, they, they confirmed the presence of the Russian regular forces in Ukrainian Donbas, at least starting from August 2014, namely in Ilovaisk battle. It was uh, the bloodiest battle at that time uh, when Ukrainian forces were surrounded by Russia. Uh, then Russia, in, in terms of negotiations, promised a green, uh, green corridor, which Ukrainian forces started using, and they were all dead uh, or captured. So that was a tragedy, uh, but the situation was completely unfavorable for Ukraine uh, in that battle. So that is why just I'm explaining the logic. So Russia is push pushing militarily her opponent for some kind of a deal. Ukraine signed the first Minsk Accord, the first document. It was basically very simple about complete and full-fledged ceasefire needed, exchange of all the prisoners, which were kept prisoners of war captured at that time by both sides, but Russia had more because of that uh, battle, and uh, 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 necessity to, to, to start negotiations about some specific rights uh, for uh, non-government control areas. At that time, they were already not under the government control, several in the Donetsk region and several in Luhansk region. And nothing happened after that. So complete and full-fledged ceasefire, which was prescribed to happen in 24 hours after the uh, signatures were made, didn't happen. Uh, exchange of prisoners of war, 
didn't happen. The only thing Russia wanted and insisted on was that Ukraine started changing its domestic legislation uh, to grant some kind of a special status for Ukrainian Donbass. So that was the logic of Russia. After that, even more bloodiest battles were started by Russia, namely the, uh, uh, the uh, in Donetsk region, uh, uh, around Donetsk airport, and in the Balto. By the way, one of the main commanders of uh, chief commanders of uh, Ukrainian forces in the Baltova operation was uh, Sirsky, yeah. was uh, Sirsky, General Sirsky, who was yesterday appointed as a chief commander of Ukrainian forces in, instead General Zeluzhny. Uh, so basically, there were even more bloodiest operations where Ukrainian forces loses a lot of people, so they were not capable of repelling the entire attack of Russian regular forces uh, because of lack of weapons and people and so on. And that was the moment when the second doc document of Minsk agreements was signed. It was the beginning of 2015. And it was more detailed, though not pretty long, let's say. The main problem of that document was, again, the point number one, ceasefire. Point number two, uh, in several days after that, the full and full-fledged exchange, 100 per 100 percent of prisoners of war. Nothing happened. The only thing Russia insisted, starting from 2014, 15, sorry, until 2022, is that Ukraine changes its constitution without having control over the border state border between Ukraine and Russia, started organizing elections in territories where Ukraine never controlled after 2014, uh, in order basically to create some kind of autonomy, which was under no circumstances in any control of Ukrainian state. With one specific detail that these territories, according to Russia's demands, had to be 100% financially supported from the national budget of Ukraine. You don't control this, you don't control the, the border, you have no perspectives that Russia will ever give you back the control over the border. You can't participate in those elections because it's obvious. So, I mean, there are people from, from the other state, there are, uh, there, there are armed groups, and no one like me or any of my colleagues would ever go there having no security uh, uh, in the region because you will just disappear in the best case. Uh, so that was the idea of Russia. And our Western partners namely Germany and France, who were playing the role of mediators in 2015, 2016, in 2017, were pushing very hard on Ukrainian government to adopt the uh, changes to Ukrainian amendments to Ukrainian legislation and to Ukrainian constitution in case, as they said, to give an argument, to give um, the reasons to show that Ukraine is ready to implement now we can expect something from Russia. And several steps were made by Ukraine, by the way. The amendments to Ukrainian constitution, giving specific rights without a very detailed list of these competencies, but the specific, some kind of a specific rights were presupposed to Ukrainian Donbas. And this was in the first um, reading, in the first hearing, it was adopted by Ukrainian parliament in August 2015, but it caused the huge protest in Ukrainian society because everyone understood that asymmetric implementation of political provisions will never bring security. And all the studies of conflicts anywhere in the world shows that security comes first, politics comes next. No elections without a uh, transition period, no elections, no special status without control over the border, you can't grant anything to the territories which you don't control. You can't allow them uh, to do what they want in, and pay for this 
in case you have absolutely no control on what is going there and this is completely under the Russian control, not yours. This was ridiculous, but this was how Minsk accords were presupposed to work. And of course they didn't work. So Russia tried to basically create the enclave of Russian Federation in the territories which they occupied. They failed because Ukraine understood this is the undermining of Ukrainian statehood from inside. Uh, and the, honestly speaking, the idea of uh, frozen conflict was already something very regular uh, for, for Ukrainian society. So uh, Ukrainian society was never uh, ready for territorial compromises. Uh, there were like five to seven to five to eight percent of the people who were ready to forget about occupied territories uh, uh, at all. No, uh, the political future of um, uh, temporary occupied territories in the Donetsk and in Luhansk regions were always uh, imagined by, uh, according to public opinion polls, as these territories come back to Ukraine under the control of Ukraine. Some of the people, uh, more than 50%, imagined that this would hap this should happen and the, um, in the, within the framework like it was before 2014, like no special status, nothing exceptional. Uh, but there were around 20% plus, plus to those 55 that were ready to grant some autonomy or something like that. And the most funny and tragic thing that Ukraine started huge decentralization reform, uh, granting local communities uh, huge opportunities leaving huge number of taxes, uh, transferring all the responsibilities and competencies and rights from the upper level of um, governance to the loyal, lower possible level of communities, like any settlements, villages, cities, whatever, after Russia started this war against Ukraine in 2014. And basically in 2017, 2018, rest of Ukraine under the control of the government had more competences and rights and money on the local level than so-called separatists demanded from Ukraine in 2014, which they found themselves uh, in a kind of North Korea state after 2014. And this is the last question, really. It's trying to 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 to, to give, uh, you know, to reveal the lie behind a lot of what we see in the media and, of course, these negotiations that you're talking about. It seems that in all of these massive conversations and agreements and whatever and the pressure that comes, Russia's fundamental strategies, strategic aims are almost ignored. Like you can't see the wood for the trees. It seemed to me at the time that Russia's aim was not to take the whole of Ukraine, but it was to turn Ukraine into a dysfunctional state, a failed state. And if it couldn't do that directly through Yanukovych or the proxies, you know, exerting control, being able to make money, inject their agents and assets into the political establishment, the administration, the military establishment, the uh, security services, and either, you know, make sure Ukraine couldn't evolve uh, as a modern uh, wealthy state, if they couldn't achieve it that way, then of course they would turn to the military solution. Vladislav Surkov has said that Minsk was not something intended to bring about peace, but quite the opposite, to enhance this failed state. And of course they 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 failed in that, in that Ukraine anyway powered ahead with reforms uh, and and has moved ever closer to being integrated with, with Europe and to becoming actually one of the leading, uh, I would say, experimental democracies in the, in the world. Absolutely. So Russia is not interested in specific, this is actually a prolongation to follow up the answer on your previous question, because I went probably too deep uh, into the details of the past, but I think, uh, you know, I find myself in a very strange uh, situation, like in 2024, uh, I still have some time to explain to journalists or to my colleagues or to audiences um, it's somewhere where, where I have a, a floor to, to, to speak. 
uh, to the audience. I ha still have to explain what was going on after 2014 because people, you know, just like have no idea. Uh, and all the when you when you do not support the narrative, what was really going on there at that time. So then you like open the space again for all these Russian narratives that about genocide in Donbas, uh, oppression of Russian speaking population, people like myself. So I spoke Russian uh, at home all my life. So I started speaking Ukrainian uh, for professional reasons only because I thought that this is the official language of the state. But at the same time, I was studying, for instance, in Luhansk uh, at the beginning of 2000s. I was studying at Ukrainian Lyceum. We studied at school in Ukrainian language. The, only, the other thing that when I came back home, I spoke Russian with my friends. So, that, that was, so there was no oppression at all. And there were not so many basically Ukrainian languages uh, schools. So we, 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 we struggled to, 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 to find them uh, in Luhansk region. So Russian population was far away from any types of oppression. But all these myths, they, they, Russia still produces them. So basically, in 2024, the goal of Russia is still the same, to, put you, to bring Ukraine back under the uh, influence and control of Russia. Russia failed to do so by all other means. Uh, the, most, uh, the most favorable mean, an instrument used by Russia for that reason, to still control former Soviet republics, post-Soviet space, was creation of so-called frozen protected conflict. So basically, Russian forces were in 90s in Moldova, in Transnistria, very uh, <clears throat> famous Russian general uh, Lebedev, uh, Lebedev. Then in 20, uh, 2008, Russia invaded with regular forces uh, two regions in Georgia, uh, South uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia, and then Ukraine in 2014. So this is a role of um, how Russia used the hybrid warfare against the states Russia formally lost the control over. Ukraine is a critical for Russia. Ukraine was is the most dynamic, is the most promising, was really one of the richest uh, republics in former Soviet Union. So without Ukraine, Russian empire in any type of its reincarnation is not possible at all. Russia doesn't care if there will be a puppet government or they will completely occupy Ukraine and just install the Russian official there and will not even play with any puppet government. They want the control over Ukraine. They need a failed state. The, the failed state uh, concept um, when it comes to Ukraine is used by Russia, by Russian officials, by Putin, starting from 2000s. And I don't even know how uh, this can change in case Ukraine right now agrees to sit down. So negotiations and diplomacy um, make the final point in absolute majority of the conflict. That's true. But negotiations might look completely different. It differs. For constructive negotiations, when it comes to the resolution of the conflict, both sides have to admit that the prolongation of the using of military means is less favorable and beneficial for them than to switch to negotiations. Right now, I don't see that this is more favorable to Russia to switch to constructive negotiations because they understand that without Western support, Ukraine will most probably be in completely unfavorable position, will be absolutely cornered, and will be probably weak enough to lost even more than Ukraine has lost as of now. This is what Russia hopes for, for at least 2024. That's why Russia does not have real intentions to switch to constructive negotiations. However, Russia has been sending signals and has been repeating that they are allegedly ready for negotiations. Why they are doing so? Exactly to slow down and to the support to Ukraine. 
to give the food to those who doubt in the West that they should send weapons and money to Ukraine. And probably it is better to go back to negotiations table. Of course, it is better in case you have the options to fight or to solve the conflict by peaceful means. But this is not what Russia wants. And the story with Minsk agreements is very good example that every time Russia wanted Ukraine to fulfill some political demands from Russia, what did they do? They increase the tensions, they increase the intensity of the warfare, they escalate. That's why both Minsk documents were signed when Russia organized bloody battles and cornered Ukrainian forces, first in Ilovaisk, then in Donetsk airport and the Baltsova. Right in the moment when leaders of four states were sitting in the Minsk and drafting the Minsk Accords number no. two, which were called, based, this is not a separate document, it was uh, the set of measures to implement the first Minsk Accord. So like detailed plan, which didn't have timeline and anything and was not really understandable what should come first. Uh, but at that very moment, when they were all sitting there, the battle was going on. So there was even no ceasefire for those 12 hours when the negotiations were held. And so we've that's... seen Russia do the same, haven't we? Every time someone visits, whether it's Biden or somebody else visits Kiev, <clears throat> it's accompanied a day or so later by intense missile barrages and vindictive um militarily pointless gestures of extreme violence um unfortunately the pattern of that behavior uh doesn't seem to uh you know western strategists do not seem to have a memory uh there's almost like goldfish syndrome that each time they come to this thinking that it's going to be different this time and uh and it never is I'd love the chance to explore these issues in 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 more detail. And of course, it's a, a rapidly changing situation as well. I think you've highlighted how important it is for Ukraine to be in a strong position um, where Russia is forced to some kind of negotiation with a weak hand. Unfortunately, the West is not supplying Ukraine to have that strong negotiating position. And we very much hope that changes. And we hope that the strategy we talked about earlier uh, really pays dividends, um, the asymmetric, uh, unconventional warfare. Um, Maria, thank you so much for talking to everyone on the channel. Uh, as we said, we've been looking forward to this for, for a long time. Uh, I strongly recommend people, if they are in Europe or London, check out the events that you take part in because they are always extremely stimulating. Uh, and we'll try and put some links to articles uh, that you've written in the description of the video. But thank you so much and Slava Ukraini. Thank you.